Hi guys, it's Thursday, it's week 8. Let's do cardiovascular pathology lecture. And the star of the show today is ectopia. Uh, and not the ectopia you're thinking about, because you're thinking about uh, maybe ACTH ectopic tumor or something. No, it's a different type, so stay tuned to find out what it is. First, let's talk about the P wave a little bit. There it is right there. And it represents the depolarization of the right and left atria, normally much smaller than the QRS complex. Um, it, what is it? It's a left electrical ECG signal that represents contraction of the atria. It occurs about halfway, th which the, the contraction occurs about halfway through the P wave moving right, uh, left to right. Uh, the Wiggers diagram, again, if you don't, this is Dr. Doe's territory, but I'm free to ask a question or two about this, so make sure you know the Wiggers diagram. You might not have even known that name, but that's what it's called, the Wiggers diagram. So for me, I'm, and this of course is the one heartbeat here, uh, so that's an EKG finding for one one heartbeat. There's the P wave, uh, the QRS complex is here, and the T wave is here. We've already talked about that. Um, this is interesting. This is the ventricular fill. So I guess we can start here, because here systole can, starts right here. This line represents systole, and this blue line is the volume of blood in the left ventricle. And you can see the, the left ventricle is loaded and ready to be ejected. When systole occurs, uh, you get a, a, t uh, a tiny, tiny delay, uh, but then the blood volume drops like crazy. Where's that blood going? Well, it's shooting up the ascending aorta. We also get the AV valve slamming shut, which is the S1 heart sound. All right, and then the, the ventricle is empty here, about as empty as it gets, uh, and now we are in diastole. When, the, when systole is over, the heart relaxes, and the S2 heart sound can hear, can be heard. What What is that? Those are the semilunar valves kind of pressure closing. And then slowly the left ventricle starts to fill up with blood again. But it gets to a point where it can't fill any more passively. And so this period between here and here is diastole, ventricular, and systole, or systolic. Or, sorry, vent, this is ventricular and atrial diastole, uh, this area right here. But then to fill the, the ventricle all the way up, we need a systole to occur, specifically atrial systole occurs right here. Now notice where the S3 and S4 heart sounds, we just talked about those in lab. Right, here's the galloping horse, the, the Kentucky sound and the Tennessee sound. The, the ventricular gallop and the atrial gallop. And, uh, yep, so notice that the S3 occurs about in the middle of this passive filling of the left ventricle. And then once atrial systole occurs, the S4 heart sound occurs about in the middle uh, of atrial systole. So I always ask questions about those two heart sounds in relation to the Wiggers diagram. And where does that transfer to on the the, sing, the EKG of a single heartbeat? S3 sound is on the isoelectric line before the P wave starts. The, S, the S4 heart sound, if it's going to occur, is actually right on the QRS segment here. Or, I'm sorry, on the, um, the PR segment. That's this flat line right here. So I always ask a question like that, so make a note card of that. All right, P wave dimensions. So there is a rule, a 2.5 little box rule. So the P wave should always fit inside a 2.5 millimeter box on the EKG paper on the grid. Um, that means the maximum length that it can be is 2.5 millimeters. And we know that one millimeter is 0 0.04 seconds, so 0 0.04 times 2.5 is 0.10 seconds. 
that's the maximum duration uh, that the the P wave should be. Um, and the maximum deflection or the maximum height of the wave is also 2.5 millivolts. Okay. The axis of the P wave, we've talked about this. We, we've already talked a lot about the axis of the, uh, the QRS complex, but the axis of the P wave points similarly, but a little bit more to the east. It's said to be east-southeast. We've already talked about that, really. Okay. What limb lead is perfectly positioned to see the axis or to see the average flow of current? Limb lead 1. Limb lead 2 is pretty good too, but limb lead 1 is the best uh, situated. Okay, um, It's very difficult to see a biphasic P wave. You need to, you need to be in the laboratory, so we're not going to worry about it any other than the slide. And that's all I'm going to say is about the axis. But there is an axis for the P wave, and there's an axis for the, the QRS complex. All right, the first concept is something called P pulmonale. What is P pulmonale? It's an EKG finding uh, of which indicates the patient has right atrial hypertrophy or even worse, right, uh, right atrial dilation. Hypertrophy, remember we said if you have pulmonary hypertension, the right heart will muscle up and trying to pump blood through the beaver dam in the lungs or wherever it may be downstream. So it gets pretty muscular, but after a while, the heart starts to fail. It can't be. That's like you're doing your max bench press every day for five years. And it may fail really quick, too. It may not take five years. Um, after that point, it becomes limp and dilated. And uh, both of these, have, there's an EKG finding called P. pulmonale. And it's caused by pulmonary hypertension, and we know I've a million times we've talked about the causes of pulmonary hypertension. Left heart failure is probably the number one. These are all downstream beaver dams, downstream from the right side of the heart. COPD, beaver dam in the lungs. An atrial septal defect that's, uh, that's on its way to causing Eisenmenger syndrome. Tricuspid stenosis, beaver dam. Actually, in that wouldn't affect the right ventricle, but it would affect the right atrium because the tricuspid valve is downstream only from the right atrium. Uh, pulmonic or mitral stenosis is another cause. What are the signs of P. pulmonale? Well, the P wave breaks the 2.5 rule. Uh, if the right atrium has gotten super big, then there's more miles of wire. And therefore, you'll have a bigger current passing through that bigger ventricle, and it'll make a bigger mark on the EKG paper. Uh, taller than 2.5 millimeters, wider than 2.5 millimeters. And if the patient has pulmonary hypertension or left heart failure, and they have this finding of the P wave, they're said to have P. pulmonale. The, white, the a P wave can be peaked sometimes. It look like a tent instead of rounded at the top. And the right ventricular axis is often shifted to the right uh, because in patients who have right ventricular hypertrophy, usually if you have right ventricular hypertrophy, you have right atrial hypertrophy as well. The only Can you think of a situation where you wouldn't have right ventricular hypertrophy, but you'd have right atrial hypertrophy? How about tricuspid stenosis? The beaver dam is just... Uh, a little bit downstream from the right atrium. All right, let's look at this 40-year-old male smoker, complaints of dyspnea and exertion. So he walks up the stairs and he's huffing and puffing like crazy. Uh, this CT scan was taken. What do you think of this? You also ordered an EKG, which we'll look at. Look at the right atrium. This here is just a coronal view of the heart. You can see the ascending aorta here left ventricle. You can see the right ventricle. Uh, we've got some contrast here in the right side of the heart. But look at how huge the right atrium is. It's bigger than the right ventricle. And if you look closely, we got calcification here. We got calcification going on up here. But, the, the, but one of the tricuspid cusps is calcified. So this is someone with tricuspid stenosis. And it's caused the right atrium 
uh, not to be able to get blood into the right ventricle. So the right atrium has been muscling and muscling for years, and now it's huge. So we can imagine what the EKG findings look like. What do they look like? Anybody see it? Well, where's the best place to look for limb lead? Or what's the best limb lead to see the P wave? Usually limb lead 1, but you also have to look at limb lead 2. In this case, it's limb lead 2. Even limb lead 3 look crazy. What's happened? Oh my god, look at that. That's almost a whole box high. It's like 5, 4 millivolts high, so that's way too big. That's Since we know uh, this is this is caused by pulmonary hypertension because he's got COPD, right? Or I guess I didn't tell you that, but uh, this is P. pulmonale because the P wave is gigantic and he's got pulmonary hypertension, right? So, yep, everything I said. It's also a little peaked, too. Instead of rounded, it's a little bit peaked. So, patient has almost positive, probably 95% chance he's got a right atrial hypertrophy and um, secondary uh, to tricuspid valve stenosis, as we saw on the CT scan. The EKG finding, therefore, makes the diagnosis of P. pulmonale. Okay, what about an inverted P wave? We haven't talked about that yet. What do you make of this? This guy's scratching his head. Oh, what is this weird thing? What in the world? So we have a P wave upside down. Everything else, QRS complex is fine. T wave is fine. What in the world would cause that? And no, it doesn't have anything to do with atrial repolarization. Where's the, the atrial repolarization wave would be upside down, but where is it? Remember your physiology? Where is the repolarization? It's right in here. But it's hidden. You can't see it. The left ventricle electricity way overpowers it, so it's hidden. So what in the world would cause it? Um, here's a hint. So here's limb lead 1 or limb lead 2, either one of those. Um, if it sees the atrial current coming right at it, like in this normal picture, it's going to draw the wave upright. So what would what phenomenon would occur to make it Draw the wave, the same camera, draw the wave upside down. Well, what if the current was going this way? That would do it, wouldn't it? Because we said a current moving away from the camera, or from the lead, draws an inverted curve, and that's exactly what's happening. So yeah, so the wave of polarization must be running away from limb lead 1 or limb lead 2. Yep, and we remember this depolarization causes a negative waveform. It's got a name. This is called retrograde conduction. So an inverted P wave is caused by blank. There's a note card for you. Retrograde conduction. Retrograde conduction. What could cause retrograde conduction? Ectopia. Oh, there's our word that we we started the lecture off with, ectopia, or an ectopic focus specifically. What in the heck is that? Well, we'll talk about that in a second, but well, I'll tell you right now. This is an ectopic foci that's occurred in the junctional region. Here's an ectopic foci which has occurred in the left atrium. Both of these situations cause um, if they beat the SA node to the punch, and this is like the new SA node, this is the new pacemaker, either one of these, um, they would be they would cause an inverted P wave because the current is moving away. See how that works? All right, and let's get into ectopy now. That means that an area of the heart other than the SA node is pacing the heart. I didn't put that down there, but I would write that in. It's pacing the heart. What does that mean? That means that it beat the SA node to depolarization. And it's sending a wave of depolarization over the right and or left atria. And that's what it is. Toppy means it wasn't the SA node, it was the atrial muscle that did it, or the junctional region that did it, or even the ventricles. But it wasn't the SA node. That's ectopia. Usually not that big of a deal. We'll talk about it here in depth in a bit. Um, it can be pesky, though. It can cause uh, 
the ventricles not to fill or eject perfectly, but it's usually not that big deal. In people with some heart conditions like atrial fib or AV NRT or AVRT, it can cause some serious problems. It can start AVRT, as we will see later on next week, probably. Ectopia is a confusing term, uh, but it just means that it's a group of cells other than the SA node uh, that depolarize. And this group of cells is called an, a focus. If it's a single cell, it's called an ectopic focus. If it's a group of cells next to each other, it's called an ectopic foci. Ectopic foci is plural. All right, uh, and then you can be a little more specific if I say, oh yeah, this patient's got a, an ectopic foci or has ectopic foci. Uh, well, where are the ectopic foci? Maybe they're in their atria. Then he has atrial ectopic foci or atrial ectopic focus. Or if in the ventricle, he's got ventricle, ventricular ectopic focus or foci, singular or plural. A junctional ectopic focus. So we need to talk about these. Well, you know the atrial areas and the ventricles. You may not know where this junction region is. We need to get into that. Yeah, Lucy, if you guys didn't know, that's Lucy, an old, even before my time, really. That was in the 50s, I think. Um, yeah, she's like, wow, there's a lot of AKAs. So there's a lot of AKAs around ectopia and ectopic beats. Um, so these all mean... All these mean the same thing. It means an area other than the SA node has is pacing the heart, or at least for one beat anyway. It's beat the SA node to the depolarization punch. Look at all the AKs. I like ectopic beats, premature beats. Ectopic foci is one we use all the time. Premature foci, skipped beat. That's the one lay people use. Oh, my heart skipped. I have a skipped heartbeat. Act, uh, an irritable focus, I hear, extra beat, premature complex, ectopic complex, premature depolarization, premature complex, ectopic, ectopia depolarization, and then autorhythmicity focus. And that's really the best description because it's a cells that have are autoarrhythmic, um, but they have they beat the SA node. You definitely want to know, ectop what are you going to learn on this slide? Definitely want to know ectopic beat, ectopic foci, maybe premature beat, irritable focus. I think that's about, skipped beat is what your patient will call it. I think that's about all that I will, ectopic complex. I don't really talk about anything other than those, but so those are the main ones you better know for sure. Um, ectopia, you can always spot it on an EKG. We'll show you how to spot ectopia here in a minute. Uh, what's the frequency of these ectopic beats? Uh, it can be one a day, or two a day, a couple a day. Uh, it could be a couple an hour. Uh, it could be a hundred an hour. It could be a few every minute. It could be a hundred every minute if your heartbeat's going that fast. It could be a hundred and fifty minute. So it really can be any frequency, and it could be running constantly. You could have a tachycardia, which is sort of an ectopic beat. What are aggravating factors? And we'll hit these again when we talk about uh, PACs. But all these, all ectopia, the heart gets really, the muscle of the heart gets really twitchy, and prone to spontaneously depolarizing uh, with these conditions. Alcohol is notorious, not while you're drinking it, probably the next day or maybe even the next day after that. It makes the heart very twitchy and prone to ectopia. Stress, studying for tests, not getting enough sleep. Combination of these things, alcohol, stress, and lack of sleep, um, that will get uh, your palpitations going real easily. I'm a master of palpitations. I've been dealing with these things for over 20 years. Uh, so I know all about them. Um, Dexomethorphan, that is in NyQuil. It's in some very good cough medicines. I can't take those at all. It'll drive my heart crazy. Certain medications, chocolate, I can't have chocolate. Caffeine, I can't have caffeine. I can have a tiny bit of chocolate, but I can't have any alcohol. can't have any caffeine. 
um, that will, I mean, I can, but it will, my heart will, I will pay and the price is not worth it. If you can believe that. Uh, where do they occur? They can occur anywhere in the heart. And we already said the atria, the ventricles, especially the junctional region, the bundle branches, pulmonary veins, very common for them to occur at right at the roots of the pulmonary veins, pulmonary arteries as well. How do you treat them? It really depends on the frequency and whether or not the patient is symptomatic. Most of the time, you don't need any treatment at all. They're super, super common in all humans. We've pro Everybody listening to me is probably, I bet 85% of people listening to me have had a uh, an ectopic premature contraction of the heart, a skipped heartbeat. You feel like, oh, my heart just skipped a beat. That's very, very common. You don't need any treatment. However, sometimes they can become problematic. People can develop anxiety and get scared they're going to die from it, and then the anxiety turns on the sympathetics, which makes the heart twitchy and makes the palpitations worse, and you get a vicious cycle. So you may need some meds, some Valium, or some meditation techniques you may to, to help fight these things. Uh, beta blocker called metropolol is works fantastic. I take this kind of PRN if I my ticker doesn't behave, and it, this is the best one I've ever tried. Uh, there's other beta blockers that that are out there, but by far this is the best one, in my opinion, and my cardiologist, Stanford cardiologist opinion as well. He's also got palpitations, so we talk a lot about this, or have talked in the past a lot about palpitations. Um, if the burden of palpitations, like if 30% of your heartbeats are coming from an ectopic foci, that can actually damage the heart. And that's very rare. It doesn't People don't, that's a lot of palpitations. Um, but if it gets that bad, then they go in and they try to find those little crazy wild cells and they zap them. They try to kill them and burn them out of there. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. What are the symptoms of palpitation? Well, hopefully, if you're lucky, none. Some people just aren't aware of their heart, uh, whatever it's doing, and that's you know, kind of a blessing. Well, it's kind of a blessing, but it's nice to know what your heart's doing in case there's some serious arrhythmia going on. Um, some people are aware of them, and it's no bother. They, eh, my heart's flipping, I don't care. No big deal. Um, other people become very anxious when they feel their heart out of whack. They think they're going to die, and they can as I just said about anxiety. Um, some people, they can get bad enough, especially PVCs, premature ventricular contractions, where they develop dyspnea. They can actually get short of breath. When a PVC occurs, you're actually not getting much blood ejected from the heart. And then, I don't know if we'll get, get to have time to... Uh, talk about um, some of the patterns of premature ventricular contractions. Um, but some of them can occur one, two, three, four, uh, right in a row. And that, uh, can, that can give you a little uh, syncope, which is uh, pre-syncope is like a fainting. You're getting close to fainting. And syncope is you're flat out fainting. Uh, what, what does this word palpitations mean? Palpitations, palpitations is diagnosed when a patient becomes aware that their heart is misbehaving, is skipping beats. Uh, the diagnosis is palpa palpitations. Very, very broad, can mean all sorts, can mean a tachycardia, could be atrial nodal reentrant tachycardia, it could be uh, atrial, just atrial, uh, atrial premature beats could be all sorts of things. All it means is the patient is now aware that their heart's not running right. What about the word arrhythmia? So you have to do an EKG, an EKG or ECG, whatever you want to call it, to, to make the diagnosis of arrhythmia. Uh, so when ectopic foci are detected on EKG, you got yourself an arrhythmia. An arrhythmia means that your heart is running, but it's not in sinus rhythm. It's another word, note card. What does sinus rhythm mean? What does sinus rhythm mean? That means the, the sinus node, sinoatrial node, the SA node, is the one that's pacing the heart. It's running the heart. And if the SA node ain't running the heart, you ain't in sinus rhythm. Right? And there's all sorts of conditions we'll look at. 
Well, we won't get time to look at bundle branches, blocks, though. All right, some special, we're starting the special types of Ectopia now. Um, so where do these ectopic beats, these retrograde, we're back to the upside down P wave. I guess we kind of came out of a rabbit hole. Where do these retrograde running ectopic foci come from? In other words, what can make the uh, what can make the current run away from limb lead one and limb lead two in the atria? Well, a left atrial premature complex in the left atria, a pack premature atrial complex is notorious. Right in the right, right is upright, but left is down, kind of downward facing. A junctional region ectopic foci can do it. Um, occasionally, a ventricular, premature ventricular contraction, um, which occurs near the bundle of hiss or near the bundle branches, that can also run backward to the conduct, conducting system and run right up into the atria and knock out the SA node. Okay, so here's the possibilities. So here's a left um, atrial contraction, premature contraction or premature beat and you can see yeah the current's running this way here's one in the junctional region in pink here's one kind of by the the bundle of hiss here and it's, the current is running back up the bundle of hiss and running through the AV node and yeah it's running backwards so it's going the all of these are going to make this upside down P wave got it all right junctional ectopia uh, let's talk about the junctional region, because I'm not sure you know what the junctional region is. In fact, they, they can't even agree completely on what the junctional region is. Uh, but it's a very common place for ectopic foci to occur. Why would it be so common? Well, first, let me, let's, let's tell you what it is first. And the, the authors argue on this. Cho, 2008, is the most evidence-based book I know. Um, he said it extends from the AV node approach tracks through the AV node and through the bundle of hiss, and that is it. Others include the tissue around that um, as well, but not, not. Uh, I guess it's pronounced shoe. So yeah, other authors confirm this, including Garcia. So this is the junctional region. What does it look like? Really cool picture of it here. So there's the AV node. Remember there's penetrating fibers that go through the fibromuscular skeleton here or the fiber skeleton. Those are the penetrating fibers of the bundle of hiss. This is the bundle of hiss. These are the approach tracks. Usually there's only one, but sometimes there's two. So anywhere in here is called a premature junctional complex if uh, the, depol the depolarization occurs in any cell or cells in this region. Those would be junctional ectopia, you could say. Okay. And now, how come? Why is this one of the most common places for, for these to occur? Well, think back to your physiology. We know with regard to autorhythmicity, we know the SA node depolarizes faster than any person on the planet. But if it's sick or it's not working right, or maybe these things are sensitized from alcohol or dexomethorphan, um, the second string pacemakers... The SA node is the fastest, but who's the naturally the second fastest depolarizer? Well, that's the AV node. Who's the third string, the third fastest? That would be the bundle of Hiss. So these are very fast depolarizers to begin with. They're constantly, they're constantly challenging the SA node for, for dominance of, for of the fastest depolarizer. So it's not, uh, it makes perfect sense if you all you need to do is add a little stimulus like, drinking too much coffee or too much alcohol or too much chocolate and these will get even more twitchy so twitchy that they'll beat the SA node to the punch and you get yourself a, uh, a premature complex junctional complex okay um, prime place for ectopia to occur everything I said because the second and third fastest depolarizers are here the AV node and its approach tracks and the bundle of Hiss so everything I just said premature junctional complexes heroes or zeros are they mischievous or are they heroes let's talk about mischievous or the zeros 
that looks like the definition of mischievous right there. Look at that little uh, face. He looks like a troublemaker, doesn't he? And that can be the junctional region. So any kind of stressors like alcohol, caffeine, that whole list I already read to you, they can sensitize the junctional region cells, make them twitchy. And yeah, they can radically and unpredictably depolarize and make the heart run out of beat. They can steal heartbeats from the SA node. And there's no reason for that other than they're mischievous. And uh, yeah, they're quite irritating to some humans. So um, that's an example of them being mischievous. And not only the, uh, the AV junctional depolarizers, the atrial can be mischievous, the ventricles as well. They can all be mischievous. Um, but the heroes are going to not really be the atria or the ventricles. Uh, but sometimes this junctional region, they can be the heroes, as we'll see. Um, there's two types of mischievousness before we go to the hero. Uh, so you can get kind of erratic, unorganized, chaotic beats, you know, maybe five in one minute and then five in the next hour and maybe a hundred in the next hour. They can just be all over the place. Um, or they could be more organized. Uh, they could go into what's called a tachycardia. They can go in a perfect rhythm only 130 beats per minute. And they can cause what's called a junctional tachycardia. Tachycardia is any heart rate over 100 beats per minute. What does junctional mean? That means the cause of the tachycardia is an ectopic foci or, fo or focus or foci maybe one cell, maybe a bunch of cells, but it's in the junctional region, so that's a junctional tachycardia. And that is one of the supraventricular tachycardias. We'll get to that probably next week, I think. Um, another kind of geek alert here, for those of you who have to know everything, um, the mischievous cardiac cells that are doing, that, that are depolarizing and being mischievous. They're called ectopic foci. Those are the cells themselves, junctional ectopic foci. Um, the EKG finding that is created by these junctional ectopic foci, uh, the EKG phenomenon that you see in the paper is called a premature junctional complex. So ectopic foci create premature complexes. And then the heartbeat that is caused uh, by this this errant signal. It's an abnormal heartbeat, but that's called a premature junctional beat, or a PJ, uh, PJ, premature junctional PJB, or sometimes it's called a PJC, premature junctional complex. No, it should be a PJB. I need to change that. Slide 40. How can I remember slide 40? I don't have any number. I have a number 42 is one of my lucky numbers. Um, so I'll look for it. It should be a beat. Uh, let's see, what else? These mischievous foci are found uh, in the AV node or its approach tracks. Could be anywhere in the junctional region. We already kind of said this. All right, let's talk about the hero. How can the SA or how can the junctional region be the hero? Like Sully here, who saved all those people with his fancy flying. When they got a bird strike, he took out one of their engines, took out both of their engines. Um, the S, if the SA node gets sick, if you get a heart attack and it dies and doesn't work anymore, are you going to die? Well, you don't have an SA node. Who's going to run the heart? No problem. The AV node is the second string, second fastest. It will run the heart. AV node is in the junctional region, so it's really a junctional rhythm that takes over. Um, if sometimes they they're not really heroes all the time. They can be sporadic. Sometimes you can get three of these junctional beats in a minute. Let's say the SA node is sputtering. It's sick, but it's kind of working. It's not working for three beats, then it's working for 100 beats. Then it doesn't work for three beats. If it's three beats or less where you see these junctional beats, that's called they're called junctional escape beats. If they're more than three in a row, they're called, that's called a junctional escape rhythm. That, I don't think I've ever seen one of these. Uh, I've seen junctional escape rhythms. So this is probably what you're going to see. But junctional escape rhythm is the hero. That means 
that means that the junctional region is not being mischievous, it's being a hero uh, because the SA node is struggling, it's not working, so it's taking over the duties and it's running the rhythm, rhythmic heartbeat. Is it a sinus rhythm? Because it runs a steady rhythm, maybe a, a, a tiny bit slower than normal. No, because it has to be to be a to be a sinus rhythm, the sinus node, sinoatrial node has to be running it and it's not. So the answer is no. It's or the answer is yes. If it's a junctional escape rhythm, uh, is is not a sinus rhythm. What can cause the SA node to fail, you may ask? Uh, well there are a couple things. So we said myocardial infarction can basically make it ischemic and take it out. An infection, myocarditis, uh, can get into the SA node and make it go sporadic or maybe even take it out permanently or maybe once if you're on antibiotics and kill the bug it'll come back. Maybe it won't. A really common one is uh, digitalis toxicity. Ironically is used for heart arrhythmias and grandpa, grandma forgets, did I take my pill? Did I not take my pill? Better take another one, and they start doing that three or four times a day. They can become, they can become toxic to them. All right. Um, you can also get something called uh, SA node block or sinoatrial node block, sinus exit block, sinus arrest. That's sometimes called, um, and that occurs could be occur from a myocardial infarction, uh, or any of these things could cause a sinoatrial node block. Uh, but it means that the impulse that is made in the SA node uh, either wasn't formed, so there's actually something wrong with the tissue of the SA node itself. A lot of times the, the depolarization is formed, but there's a capsule around the SA node, uh, and the capsule can become fibrotic and not let the action potential out of the node. So those are, it, it's blocking, both of these are blocking the SA node from making a signal. All right, let's do a patient here. 38-year-old comes in for a pre-employment physical. Says he's in fantastic health. And you run an EKG. What do you think? Our, our intervals look good. Always look for those. But then we look at the heart rate. What's the heart rate? Dr. Doe teach you that? I think he did. Like the 300, 150, 100 rule. So if there's the top of the Q wave, the start of the R wave, top of the Q wave, so we can count. If the next one was here, that would be 300 beats per minute. If it was here, that'd be 150 beats per minute. It's not. If it was here, let's see, I lost count. 300, 150, 100. It's not 100. If it was here, it'd be 75, 60. 50, so it's a, the heart rate's about 50 beats per minute. Okay, so, and it looks steady. I don't see any premature beats in here. Looks like a steady rhythm. Um, it's slow, right? It's anything under 60 is a bradycardia. Not super slow, though. Okay, now let's look at the waves. There's the T wave, QRS complex. Uh-oh, see a problem? By the way, these three dots... That means this pattern goes on and on and on. Three dots. What, or what do you see? Where's the P wave? Where is it? it should be here, right? Shouldn't it be like that? There should be a PR segment. So what's the deal? What is this thing? Ah, I hear some of your minds saying it's an inverted P wave. I bet, and you are right. That is an inverted P wave. So heart rate was 50. The rhythm was steady. We have an inverted P wave. And this is actually a, a junctional escape rhythm. Patient had a myocarditis six weeks earlier. He thought he was better. The infection was in into his SA node, and his SA node wasn't working. Had no idea. Um, here's this in paper, if you don't know. You have to memorize this because I might ask you what a heart rate is. I assume you know this, but you have to memorize these numbers. Pretty easy. That's a perfect score in bowling, right? 300. Half of 300 is 150. Then we go to 100. 
then 75 I always said how can I remember 75 I had this guy on my wall he was a monster Deacon Jones from the Rams Los Angeles Rams back in the day about ready to crush Johnny Unitas right here of the Colts um, so that's how I remember that and then I just remember 60 50 another lucky number 43 and 37 I just kind of remember it's not super accurate when you get down here but up here it's pretty darn accurate these first four all right so yeah the patient um, turned out if you he was he was actually a little below if you do the 1500 millimeter box rule turned out to about 43 beats per minute but yeah that's a so it's an upside down wave and the next question is well where in the heck is the PR segment where is the PR segment? Um, so remember the PR interval is P wave and the PR segment. PR segment or the PR interval is over once the Q wave starts. R S. QRS complex. So this is the PR segment. This is the PR. I'm sorry, that's the PR interval. This is the PR segment right here. Where is it? It's gone. So that's another another sign that there's been an ectopic beat if you don't see that. All right, so what are some EKG findings of junctional ectopia? Well, rule number one, make a note card. You need to know these. P wave will be always upside down. The no exceptions. It's not true with atrial ectopic foci. But with junctional ectopic foci, it's always upside down. Why? Because the current's always running away. PR segment will always be gone. Right? Because there's atrial ectopic foci that can invert the P wave uh, in the left atria. What's the difference? Uh, well, the atrial ectopic foci always have a P wave. The junctional ectopic foci never have a P or never have a PR segment, sorry. The left, um, the left ectopic foci in the atria will always have a PR segment. Not true of a junction ectopic foci. My brain's about had it for today, but I'm going to keep going until it's getting late. Um, yeah, PR segment's gone. Um, now the P wave, we saw it. We saw it here. We may not see it. Because the P wave could be, maybe the P wave's here. It's hidden behind the powerful QRS complex. We won't see it. Maybe the P wave's way over here. So the P wave can be in different places on the tracing. So we need to talk about that. So here's kind of what that looked like. If you had a junctional ectopic foci going, current would be running away from limb lead one or two. And yep. That's that's pretty much what that looks like. And when it, when it occurs, remember decrement. Some might say, well, what won't decremental decondu or conduction occur? Decremental conduction won't the the signal get slowed down here? No, if it occurs in the the AV node, it wipes out decremental conduction. Okay, so now this is an important slide. Um, it's pretty simple. So we can actually tell where in the junctional region the ectopic foci. It's pretty good, like 90% accurate. So if it's in the approach tracks, or if it's in the, the first part of the AV node, then you're going to see what we just saw. You'll see an inverted P wave right before the QRS complex. If it's in the distal part, you know, in, when I say it, the ectopic foci, the cells that are misbehaving, if it's in the distal part of the AV node, you're not going to see a P wave because it'll be hidden behind the QRS complex. And if it occurs further downstream in the bundle of Hiss, P wave will be actually after the QRS complex. So let's take a look at this. And see what we can see here. So here's the P wave, an inverted P wave, no PR segment, must be coming from either the approach tracks, which are here, so it must be coming from here, 
or the proximal part, the upstream part, of the AV node. So ectopic foci anywhere here will give you this look. Okay? You'll see the you'll see the premature junctional complex right there. If it occurs in the distal part, let's change colors. If it occurs here or here, so the distal part of the AV node, you're not going to see anything. It's going to be it's going to be hidden. See how it's hidden here? It's going to be hidden by the QRS complex. I'll show you an example of one of those. Now, if it's further down, if it's in the bundle of Hiss, you'll see it still be inverted. You'll see it after uh, the QRS complex. Say, got it? Very important slide. Make a note card of it. You, you need that for the test. Okay, let's do a case. 18-year-old female comes in. So she's got some weird feelings in her chest, some anxiety going on, hard night of partying a couple nights ago. You said, okay, let's do an EKG. You're kind of young for any problems, but let's see what we can see. What do we see? And is the patient in sinus rhythm? That's my first question. How do we analyze this thing? And this is the rhythm strip. This is limb lead 2 running. I just kind of eyeball it first to make sure that all these um, these R waves, right? That's the up limb. That's the peak of the R wave um, or the QRS complex. It's the top of the QRS complex. They're all about the same. I can just eyeball that and and see that they're about the same. And we'll you'll get better at this when we look at premature atrial complexes. So I don't see any premature atrial complex going on here or, or premature ventricular contraction going on here. Next thing we have to do, what is the speed of this thing? So let's grab one of these that's kind of close to um, a hash mark. I don't really see any. Now this one's kind of halfway between the two big boxes. I mean, I mean one big box. Here's one big box right from here to here. So it's kind of about halfway. So right here would be 300. This would be about 150. And this would be about 100. So we got a heart rate of about 100. So we do have a tachycardia. Maybe it's 105. Maybe they're just anxious and you know, maybe it's normal. But technically they do have a fast heart rate. But then look at the, let's look at the waveform. So there's the T wave, looks fine. QRS complex looks nice and narrow. Yep, you saw it because we've already looked at it. Where in the heck is the P wave? Where's the PR segment? Where's that flat line? You don't see it, but there it is. There's the P wave. It's inverted. There's no PR segment. So I can already tell you, pretty good guess, where this, uh, if, if it's a zero or hero, Oh, well, it's a, it's a zero, right? It's, it's mischievous. We, we're running the heart too fast. So this patient's in a tachycardia. Specifically, they're in a, a junctional tachycardia. And we can tell where the ectopic foci is, or focus is. We don't know if it's one or two or five cells or a hundred cells causing this, but there are cells beating the SA node to the punch. And we know because we can see it, and it's to the left before the QRS complex, we know that it's coming from either the approach tracks or the proximal, kind of the upstream part of the AV node. Got it? All right. That's everything I just said. And you can read all about it. Is it a sinus rhythm? No, of course not. The SA node is not doing this. So, this patient is not in sinus rhythm. Okay, it's a junctional tachycardia. Specifically, did I say? I didn't tell you what it was. Oh, yeah, I did. Junctional tachycardia. That's one of the supraventricular tachycardias. All right, let's look at the PR interval really quickly. And the PR, again, it's made of a P wave. Right, there's the P wave. And then it's made of a PR segment together the wave and the segment make up the PR interval. 
right? The end of the PR segment and the end of the PR interval is either at the start of the Q wave. Remember I said a lot of times you don't have a Q wave. Or if the Q wave isn't there, it's at the start of the up limb of the R wave. That's where it starts. We've already talked about that before. All right, there's the P wave, the PR segment, everything I said. Well, if it starts at the start of the Q wave, why isn't it called the PQ segment? And I already told you that. Guyton actually calls it the P PQ segment. But the, the Q wave is very often not present. So it will be confusing to call that. That's why it's called the PR, because the R wave is always there. All right. What's the definition of the PR interval? It's the time it takes the action potential to travel through the right atrium, through the AV node. That's the actually PR segment, right? That's the flat part when it's going through the AV node and the, the slow down portion of the AV node. Then the bundle of Hess and the Purkinje fibers. And, yep, that's it. What's normal? Now, the rule. Now, so we learned one. What was the first rule we learned today? A little review. 2.5 millimeter rule. All right, P wave should always be able to fit in one little box on the EKG paper. Here's the next rule. The PR interval should always be uh, between 3 to 5 millimeters. So at the least it should be is 0.12 seconds. The greatest it should be, which I can't think of a condition that causes it to be too big. So you could almost throw that one away for our purposes. But uh, the 12, the 0.12 seconds um, shouldn't be smaller than that. That's the, the least it should be. It should always be three little boxes. And then another key to to knowing the PR interval is normal, you have to have a PR segment. Sometimes the P wave will almost be 3 millimeters, but if there's no PR segment, it's not normal. right? You have to have a PR segment. If it's not there, that's it's not normal. Let's take a look at this. Is this a normal PR interval? Hmm. Is it a normal PR interval? Well, let's measure it. So this one's right on the hash mark. 3 by 5 rule. It should never be smaller than 3 boxes. 1, 2, 3. Yeah, it's exactly 3 boxes. And there is a PR interval right there, or, or PR segment right there. So yeah, that's a normal. That's normal looking. Okay, what about this one? Oh, that's there's something messed up there, isn't there? Let's draw it. So it's about here. There's one box, two boxes. Uh, no, three boxes would be right here. It's shorter than three boxes. It's like two and three quarters, so it's too short. Plus, remember I told you last time that the QRS complex has to be built with straight lines? Right? But no extra lines. Look at this. This one. I'm doing them blue. It's got a bump right here. What's the deal with that? And then there's a this weird looking. Then we see a straight lines here and here. Uh, that's no good. Um, so that's called a delta wave. This is a patient with Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Remember that. That's a high yield board term. We'll come to that. Um, yeah, they have a hole in their fiber skeleton. Have we talked about that? I don't think we have. Uh, but yeah, this is no good. Um, yeah, that's what we need to say. Where's the P wave? It's right here. We can see it. Is it inverted? Is that it? Right there? No, that's not it. It's right here. P wave. Got it? But there's no PR segment, right? So the PR interval is too short. So, everything I just said. No good. Okay, shortened PR intervals. What what does that even mean? Well, it can mean three things, really. 
They have junctional ectopia. We've already talked about how that shortens it. Because if a uh, ectopic foci occurs in the AV node, there's no slowdown portion. It goes right through the slowdown portion. So remember that PR segment is the, represents the slowdown portion. If you don't have a slowdown portion, then you don't have a PR segment. Then wolf parkinson white syndrome, a hole in the fibrous skeleton. Or you get some track, some tissue that can conduct current, and it goes around the AV node and plugs into the bundle of Hess. Right? Those are bypass tracks. Uh, so together, hole in the fibrous skeleton are these by press, bypass tracks, the most common of which is called longanon levine syndrome. Um, these are called accessory conduction pathways. So accessor accessory conduction pathways, junctional ectopia, uh, even a damaged no AV node from a, a myocardial infarction, these can all cause a short PR interval. I can guarantee you this slide's going to be on the test, and it's probably going to be on part two boards as well. So make sure you know this stuff. All right, let's do one of these. These are fun. 65-year-old male comes in, some neck pain, a little dyspnea, exertion, malaise. What's that mean, malaise? doesn't feel good. That's flu-like symptoms. just feels yucky. He's also diabetic. He has had a mild myocardial infarction three years ago. He said it's no problem. So his memory's not as great as it used to be, but he's hanging in there. You run an EKG on him to make sure everything's okay. What do you see? Gets a little lightheaded, too. Did I put that in here? does get a little lightheaded when he stands up fast. The three dots means this pattern is going and going and going. Okay, you're getting better. I hear some of your minds catching on. T wave is right here. Curious complex. What about the P wave? There's the P wave, but what's the deal with it? Well, it's peaked. Don't worry about that. It's got a little PR segment, but not much. What's the heart rate before we go farther? 300, 150, 100, Deacon Jones, 75, 60, 50, 43, 37. It's slow. Remember I said it's not super accurate when it gets down here. That's probably 32, 33 beats a minute, and it's slow. That's why he's not feeling good. He's getting a little dizzy when he stands up. Where's the? So what's the deal with the P wave then? We have to blow that up and look at that. Um, is that three three by five rule? Is that three? Uh, one two. Th it's almost three. One two. No, it's not. It's short. Uh, plus, if you're in doubt, where's the PR segment? Where's the flat line? There's no flat line. So we have uh, hero or zero. It's upside down. There's no PR segment. It can't be coming from the atria. Looks like a looks like a happy face, doesn't it? Um, what's causing this? Yeah, it's a it's an ectopic foci in the junctional region. Where in the junctional region? Well, we can see it. It's to the left of the curious complex. So, it's coming from either the approach tract approach tracks or the proximal part of the AV node. Now, is it a hero or a zero? Well, if this is going on and on and on, it's steady. It's a hero, right? The guy had a heart attack. It took out his SA node, and he's had, a S, he's had no SA node for the past three years. Nobody's really... Maybe they told him, and they forgot about it, and yeah. So it's kind of the hero in this case. Bradycardia is down like 32 beats per minute. I didn't do the 1500 little box rule on it, but um, yeah, there's everything I said. You can review. And junctional escape rhythm, yep. The myocardial infarction damaged his heart, damaged the AV node, it's broke, or the SA node's down, it's broken. Sinus bradycardia, we should do the definition of that. Um, it is a heart rate less than 60, and there's probably some of you listening who have heart rates down in the 40s, or at least in the 50s. You're in really good shape. Um, that's normal. 
uh, for people. When when do you worry about? Do you worry about? Am I worried about you guys who have a heart rate at 52 or 48 or even lower, and you're in great shape? No, uh, I worry when you start becoming symptomatic, and that's uh, a bunch of cardiologists agree with that. You don't get too excited about heart rate that slow. Heart rate that fa that's fast is a problem because it can wear out the heart. Heart rate that slow is fantastic. You just going to live longer. The heart's not working that hard. What are the symptoms of bradycardia? Probably none. Uh, but if it does get too slow, you start getting low energy and malaise, and you can't do exercise. You get so exhausted from exercise and cyanotic if it gets bad and syncope and yeah. What's the causes of a bradycardia? Great fitness is for one. It's physiological sinus bradycardia that's called when you're in great shape and you just have a low heart rate. Uh, increased intracranial pressure from a brain injury. That's always a serious side when the heart rate gets down to 30 and 40 and 30. Uh, indicate a brain injury. Beta blockers. Taking too many beta blockers or, or calcium channel blockers can do that. Just getting old can do that, slow down the heart. Um, uh, the sex sinus syndrome, a problem with the SA node, whether it be an infection, autoimmune attack, or uh, the, the sinus, the SA node is being taken out and it's not working anymore. Heart disease, myocardial infarction, hypothyroidism can do all sorts of crazy things to the heart. Even obstructive sleep apnea, is, we're learning more and more about that, it causes all kinds of trouble. I've talked about this a couple times. Let's put a slide in. The 1500 uh, little box rule, much more accurate than the 300, 150, 100 rule, or the bowler's rule, I call it, the 300 perfect score. Uh, so you just, you take, uh, you count the number of small boxes between the RR peaks of the RR waves, uh, and then you use this formula. 1500 divided by the number of small boxes will give you the exact heart rate. Let's try it here. Okay, so there's the top of the R wave there. So there is 5 would be right here. 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, maybe 46. Yeah, so it's around 32. Oh, I did right here. 36 it came out 46.5. So it comes out to 32.3 beats per minute. Great. That's a non-sinus. Is a sinus rhythm? Well, could be sinus rhythm, but no, not with an inverted, uh, inverted uh, P wave without a, without a PR segment. That's not sinus rhythm. How about this one? 77-year-old man comes in, suffered a myocardial infarction six weeks ago. His neck pain and back pain from his hospital stay wants treatment. He said, hold on there, Tiger, let's uh, let's get an EKG, get a baseline of you. So you run an EKG, and this is the heart rate pattern. His heart rate is 35 beats per minute. What do you make of this? goes on and on, so obviously it's a, it's a rescue. Uh, it's kind of a rescue rhythm here. Uh, well, where's the P wave? I know you guys are looking for it. I don't see it. Is it hidden behind the QRS complex? Oh, what's going on with the T wave? Ah, we got some weirdness here, don't we? In fact, that, some of you found it. That's right there. So we know who's running the heart. Who's running the heart? The AV node? Nope. If it was the proximal AV node, we'd see it up here. Is it the distal AV node? No, we wouldn't see anything. So it's actually beyond the AV node, which is the bundle of Hiss. It's the late bundle of Hiss actually running this. That's where the ectopic foci is. See how cool that is? Alright. It's a junctional escape rhythm. And he lost his SA node in, during the heart attack. Alright. Junctional escape rhythm, yeah. Lost the SA node, got knocked out, and yeah, the cells in the, eight, the junctional region We'll pace the heart. Okay, that's enough for your brains. See you all next week.